It is now time for a question period. The member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Speaker. And my question is to the Deputy Premier. I find it remarkable that this government, which claims to be so open and transparent, can continue to pull the wool over Ontarians' eyes. Yesterday, the Premier met with the leader of the third party. It would seem to me that they are simply planning their next move on Ontario's peril. The NDP were handed seven of their demands in this pathetic excuse for a budget and are asking for more. While the leader of the third party stands here one day claiming she has lost confidence in this government's accountability, the next day is meeting with the Premier in a bid to keep them in power and the NDP at the table. Well, a pox on both your houses. Ontario needs a change. We need real action and an immediate stop to these charades and delusions of grandeur. Question. Would the Deputy Premier please tell us, did your Premier take the Lexus Lane to meet with the leader of the third party to throw future Ontario jobs under the bus? Yeah, yeah. Well, Speaker, um, I think what this province needs is a budget. And I think we need a budget to be passed in the House, and that's what we all should be talking about, Speaker. And you know, there's a lot at stake. This isn't a game about a, a political game, Speaker. This is about real people who are waiting to know whether or not this budget is going to be passed, Speaker. So let's talk about who's watching very, very carefully. Maybe the 30,000 young people who are going to benefit from the uh, youth job strategy, Speaker. They're watching very carefully to see whether this legislature will pass the budget that will get them the jobs that they need, Speaker. How about the families and uh, the low-income families who are waiting Sir. to see whether we collectively will pass a budget that will increase Thank the Ontario? Thank you. Before I go to the supplementary, the member from Cambridge will come to order. Supplementary. Well, I should have expected that kind of public relations messaging coming from a party with an unelected premier. It seems to me, it seems to me that the only thing that they can do right is to spin and shift focus away from their failed record. We'll spin this. Out of all the provinces, Ontario has the highest level of provincial debt, $273 billion. Ontario has lost. No, don't use the opportunity when it gets quiet to talk. Supplementary finish question, please. Ontario has lost 58,000 private sector jobs in March alone. Here's the spin for the Liberal Comms Office. You cannot spend more money than you're taking in and still hope to balance the books. Taking advice from a party that is infamous for Ray Days is not only poor strategy, but also compromises the future of the province. Question. Credit rating agencies have already downgraded Ontario. Deputy Premier, how can you stand here and tell Ontarians your government is being transparent or does the NDP have to make another ask Thank for you. that? Yeah. Speaker, as, as you can imagine, there are a lot of people talking about what this budget means for them. And I think the member opposite might not care about the people on social assistance who are very, very uh, excited about the opportunity to keep more of the money that they earn. But I bet he will care about what Ian Howcraft, the vice president of uh, Canadian manufacturers and exporters, has to say about this budget. He says, we are pleased to see the government formally recognize the importance of manufacturing to the province's economy. Overall, this budget is a good signal that the province wants to work closer with industry. Speaker, this is a budget that has widespread support. It's time to get this budget passed. Answer. Thank you. Final supplementary. The Deputy Premier should be mortified, Speaker, that this is the hope that has been offered to Ontario families. Ontarians deserve more. Ontarians deserve a government with a Premier of their choosing, which yours is not. Ontarians deserve transparency. Secretly meeting with the leader of the third party in backroom talks does not instill confidence in me or in the rest of Ontario that your Premier actually wants transparency. The time for talk has ended, Speaker. Now is the time for action. Yeah. Only Tim Rudek and order. the Ontario PC Caucus yeah, yeah. have shown clear and principled leadership to Turn bring Ontario General back to order. the top in places to live, economic performance and opportunity. The leader of the third party has made a deal with the devil. Deputy Premier, does your caucus actually believe in its own budget? I'm, I'm what? 
the member from Etobicoke North will resist because I want him to go to his seat so I can tell him to stop. Um, borderline, I, I'm going to remind you to stay uh, away from that kind of uh, language, please. Finish. You have a uh, wrap up. I'll just put the question, Speaker. Deputy Premier, does your caucus actually believe in its own budget, or is the leader from the third party giving you a pill that's Thank just you. too tough to swallow? Deputy Premier. You know, Speaker, the, uh, the member opposite uh, raises the question of, uh, of a democratically elected leader, Speaker. I think he might also take a moment to think about what the people of Ontario uh, sent to the legislature the last time we went to the polls. They sent a minority government. They want us to make minority government work, Speaker. That's exactly what we're doing. This budget contains essential liberal values. It also contains elements that are common ground with your party, with the third party, but over, over and above everything else, this Order. is the budget that the people of Ontario want and are anxious for it to be passed. Thank you. New question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Deputy Premier. This week at the Justice Committee, we heard the Liberal political interference drove up the cost of your gas plant scandal. Michael Kalevi of the OPA sure, the told us the Energy Minister's Chief of Staff instructed them to put a richer counteroffer to give the Oakville proponent more money. This morning, John Kelly of the Attorney General's uh, Ministry told us the province had no obligation to pay damages for the full value of the contract, yet the Premier's office clearly instructed the OPA to do so. The Premier signed off on the 2011 deal that kicked off this drive of costs in Oakville. Question. Her signature was on that document. Deputy, why won't any of you admit when you knew it was more than $40 million? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Governor Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think the member uh, should review Hansard of what Mr. Kelly told the committee this morning. Let me share some quotes with him. This is what he said on the idea of uh, the, the issue of negotiating by the Premier's office. He said, and this is John Kelly, Counsel of the Ministry of the Attorney General, to be fair to them, by that he means Mr. Stevie, Jameson Stevie, the Premier's office, he did say throughout these notes that they were not there to negotiate, they were there to listen. He went on further, Mr. Speaker, to outline how important it was to reach a deal with TCE as opposed to uh, going into litigation. And let me again quote, in my experience of 40 years of litigating, if you can avoid litigation, ah, you should. It's a process that is fraught with risk. I think what Mr. Kelly did Sir. was point out that in the situation we were in, we took the best course in terms of negotiating. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I come from Northern Ontario, and I got to tell you, you can put as much baking soda on a dead skunk as you want, it still stinks. <laughs> Mr. Khalidi joined a long list of witnesses who told the committee the Liberal government knew for months the Oakville cancellation costs would be higher than $40 million. But no Liberal will stand up and tell us when they knew that. Your Premier was either part of or leading the government that directed those bad proposals that drove up the cost. Your government squandered $585 million that, that could have that all to benefit the Liberal seat savers instead of going to cancer treatments, MRIs, or long-term care for seniors. Will somebody over there tell the Ontario taxpayers why you refused our confidence motion in this House yesterday? Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the, the member opposite references the Premier, and I would remind him that it was this Premier who wrote to the Auditor General and asked him to expand his investigation because of the low, and if you look into the Oakville situation. And Mr. Speaker, let me quote what Michael Kil Kilevy said in front of the committee. He said, I quote, listen to this. He said, these costs cannot be known with certainty at this point in time. He went on to say the cost of relocation of both plants are estimates which are dependent on assumptions and information that becomes available over time. Because of this, numbers can and do change. I think, Mr. Speaker, you would agree that we've taken the responsible course in asking the Auditor General to look into the situation. 
situation. But you know, Mr. Speaker, if you want to talk about Mr. Kalibi, let's talk about what he said by, about the opposition's antics to have documents released during the negotiations that were going on. He had first to say, he said, when we were at the negotiations, we were always trying to keep a close eye on the cost to the rate payer, payer keeping it as low Thank as you. possible. I'll finish Thank it you. in my supplementary. Final supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Deputy, your Premier's political apology was just that, political. You know, at home, when you break a window, you don't say, I'm sorry the window broke. You say, I'm sorry I broke the window. Oh, yeah. You know, your Premier said, I'm sorry for the decisions that were made. And she said, I'm sorry about the mistakes the government made. But it was the Premier who signed off on the 2011 arbitration agreement and several other of you cabinet ministers wow. who signed off on that as well. What Ontario wants to hear is, I'm sorry I made those decisions. And somebody from the Liberal Party has got to stand up and say that. Will it take a judicial inquiry and the threat of jail doors slamming to get somebody over there to tell us the truth, Speaker? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the member talks about politics. Let's go back to last summer when there were very delicate negotiations going on, and he and members of the opposition were calling for sensitive, commercially sensitive documents to go forward. And as I said, this is what Mr. Kalevi had to tell the committee. You want to hear what you want to talk about, Mr. Kalevi's testimony? This is what he said. When we were at the negotiations, we were always trying to keep a close eye on the cost to the ratepayer, keeping it as low as possible. That's right. And if documents were disclosed, it could certainly prejudice our position in negotiations. Mr. Speaker, that honourable member and his colleagues could have cared yes, less sir. last summer when they were demanding sensitive documents to come forward, which would have prejudiced the negotiations. Mr. Speaker, he's one to talk about Thank playing you. politics. Thank you. New question, the member from. Thank you, very much, Mr. East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. We are pleased that after months of hard work by New Democrats, the Premier has agreed that she needed to own up and apologize for the gas plant fiasco. But taking responsibility means more than just saying you're sorry. It means taking steps to make sure that it never happens again. Will the, the Minister of Finance be adding new accountability and transparency measures to his budget? Minister of Finance. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, accountability measures are critical in any operations of any government. It is why we've introduced accountability measures in 2004 with the Fiscal Transparency exactly. Accountability Act. Right. We took initial steps to ensure that any pre election report be assessed appropriately so we don't have a repeat of what happened when they had a $5 billion hole in their budget. Another item, we also provided an accountability act called the Broader Public Sector Accountability Act in 2010, again to bring higher accountability standards for lobbyists and, in, and enabling us to ensure that any activities going forward are measured and are, have proper oversight. And Mr. Speaker, in the budget, under pages 217 to yes, pages sir. 220 and pages 143 to 145, we have a number of accountability measures that have been added to ensure that we take proper steps and proper oversight measures always. Supplementary. None of those things that the finance minister just talked about stopped want for one second what happened in the gas plant fiasco, not one of them. Speaker, words are easy to say, uh, but taking action requires real leadership. New Democrats worked for weeks, and we finally got an apology for the gas plant fiasco. But now we need to see action to make sure we aren't back in the same situation on some other matter. Will the finance minister agree that the premier's apology is one thing, but Ontarians want to see real action on accountability and transparency? Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, we agree that we have to enhance accountability on an ongoing basis. <clears throat> we recognize that certain mistakes occurred and corrective actions have been taken. We have provided legislation which have been stalled by the opposition to try to do just that when it comes to air ambulance and other measures. We are doing what's necessary, and the suggestions provided by the third party are interesting. And we're, we're, we welcome the opportunity to have that discussion, and we look forward to having a very productive conversation 
But let's get the budget passed, Mr. Speaker. Let's move forward because what's at stake right now is even greater, and that's the people of Ontario and ensuring that we take these initiatives that are in this budget to move forward. But yes, we'll, we're very open and welcome any further enhancements that we can make to accountability measures. Thank you. Final supplementary. Ontarians are tired of being let down by their government. I hope everyone agrees that Ontarians deserve better. An apology doesn't give families any comfort that waste and scandals will be stopped before they start. Does the finance minister agree with Ontarians that the budget needs to be more transparent and more accountable to people in order to end all of the things that have happened in the past? Minister of Finance. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me refer to pages 217 and pages 143. We have chapters in this budget that speaks to accountability. We have measures in here that speak to the initiatives to enhance and increase our accountability. We agree. We recognize how important to have these oversight measures in place. We're taking those steps. We've done so under the ministry of finance. We're doing so with all ministries, for that matter. And under the Treasury Board and Management Board of Government, we're taking initiatives to ensure accountability. So to the response to the member opposite, I appreciate your suggestions. We welcome them. We're taking actions on them as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question. The member from Kitchener and Waterloo. To, to the finance minister. Ontarians told us that the budget needed to be made more fair, accountable, and transparent. Will the finance minister tell Ontarians if this government will actually start being accountable and create a financial accountability office? Thank you, Minister of Finance. Well, I appreciate the fourth question on the matter. Yeah. <clears throat> and let me reaffirm that we're taking measures, we're taking precautions, we're taking steps to initiate even greater accountability. <clears throat> I appreciate the recommendations made by the third party. For that matter, I appreciate recommendations made by all parties. What we need is to put forward a budget that does, a, does indeed speak to the people of Ontario. We have a budget that is balanced, that is fair. It speaks to those that are wanting to invest in Ontario. It also speaks to those that are most vulnerable in Ontario to help them. But more importantly, we want our government to be accountable. We want our government to deliver on its, on its issues, and we want the government to deliver for the people of Ontario. We're looking forward to doing that together. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, Ontarians want and they need this budget to be made more transparent, accountable, and fair. Will the government ask Ontarians' ombudsman to oversee our health care system and act as an advocate for patients? Thank you, Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, what we need right now is to pass the budget that talks about creating jobs, promoting growth, that talks about being fair to all Ontarians, and that talks about helping people in their everyday lives. This budget speaks to that. It also speaks to measures to increase accountability to ensure that whatever government is in power, that it be accountable. Whatever government and whatever uh, programs are brought forward, that we have proper oversight. We recognize that. We share those same concerns. We want to make certain, though, we pass this budget and let's work towards making us all more accountable, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, Ontarians told us that the budget needed to be made more transparent, accountable, and fair. That's what they want to see. That's what they need to see. Will the finance minister agree to stop telling families they need to pay $300 million to toll carpool lanes, while at the same time he hands a $1.3 billion corporate tax loophole to corporations? Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, the notion of uh, a tax loophole of $1.3 billion is not true. It's not a loophole. It's not new. It is something that has been in existence, and it comes to the exemption comes forward in 2015 to 2018. We're asking the federal government to work with us to curb and initiate and stop those initiations so that we can balance our books. But, Mr. Speaker, around reducing gridlock, I would expect that the third party would agree that we need to enhance HOV lanes in order to initiate and reduce gridlock for the benefit of all Ontarians. 
You know, the extra hour that a transport truck is stuck in traffic is an extra hour of lost productivity. And we're talking about $6 billion in lost productivity in this province because of gridlock. Answer. So we have to take these steps to move forward on that. So I would hope that we've passed the budget and let's work together for the benefit of all Ontarians. Thank you. New question, a member from Bolton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I advise to ask the Minister of Finance a question. Minister, when I rose to notice yesterday morning, uh, your government had 36 hours to prevent a strike, an impending strike at the LCBO. Now there are 13 hours left <laughs> to prevent that strike that would embarrass this province hurt its, and hurt its tourism industry on this long weekend. Now a day later, and no progress has been made. In fact, OPSU union bosses have ordered the setup of dozens of strike headquarters across the border. Minister, when people say that they want a dry, long weekend, an LCBO strike is not what they had in mind. Will you stand with Ontarians today and prevent an LCBO walkout, or will you play your usual game and cower to the big union buddies in the public sector? Minister Finance. Cowering to the union bosses. Mr. Speaker, we respect the collective agreements. We want the LCBO and the employees to bargain in good faith. We recognize that the members opposite would rather create havoc and not allow for a collective agreement to occur. We're not, that, we're not doing that, Mr. Speaker. We're going to allow them to do and have their discussions. I'm hopeful and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that they'll come to an agreement so that we'll all enjoy a good long weekend but let them let them do their thing, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Minister, in 2009 collective agreement, your Liberal government awarded OPSU workers at the LCBO with a 7.75 wage increase over four years, almost double the rate of inflation. If the latest Statistics of Canada data is to be believed, OPSU is demanding that part-time staff at the LCBO be paid double, double what the equivalent employee in the private sector would receive. That's double, Minister. This government cannot afford to continue awarding big raises to unions at the expense of Ontario's fiscal future. Will the Minister of Finance stand here today and commit to taxpayers that no increases will be awarded? The liquor sales will proceed this weekend. Thank you, Minister of Finance. So let me be clear. <clears throat> what the opposition want are results. And what, we've, and what we've been able to achieve is close to zero, zero over the last couple of years. Our envelope and our compensation envelope remains the same. It's important, and, and please recognize that our, spending, our growth in spending has been below 1%, so we are achieving results. We recognize that the parties all want to negotiate. Allow them that opportunity, because when they bargain in good faith, when they have that ability, it provides for the best result in the end. I'm hopeful that we are going to have resolution. A mediator is involved. A blackout is now before us. Let them do their work. Let them do their work, and let's come to a resolution Answer. that all parties will agree to. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la... I have a question for the Minister of Health. Speaker, yesterday. The Ontario Ombudsman came to committee that was looking at Bill 11, the Air Ambulance Act. Mr. Murray, yet again, urged the government to grant his office oversight of Orange. Speaker, the Ombudsman had received complaints from whistleblowers years before the scandal made the headlines. He was told about high executive compensation and the use of public dollars in the private sides of Orange. But he was unable to investigate. My question is simple. Has the minister heard enough proof? Is she finally ready to grant Umberman's oversight of Orange in our health care system? Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. And um, I am delighted that Bill 11 is now before committee. I think uh, members of the committee are doing their work, and that's exactly what they should be doing. Speaker, it's important to me that this legislation get passed. Yeah. It's also important to me that the, uh, that the committee do their work, hear from witnesses, and make their decisions about the bill going forward. So uh, I, I want to let that committee do its work. It's an important piece of legislation. I look forward to it coming back, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Ombudsman oversight is not in the bill, and unless the minister gives it okay, it will never be included in the bill. The committee cannot do this without the minister's support. Ontarians were hoping that Orange would mark the end of an era of scandals in our health care system. They want to be assured that our health care dollars are being properly spent and serving the needs of people of Ontario. We will continue to lack accountability and transparency unless the Ombudsman receive <laughs> the rights to investigate complaints. The Ombudsman actually received complaints about hospitals, hundreds of them every year, about long-term care homes, and continues to receive complaints about Orange, but he doesn't have oversight. Will the minister prove that her government is capable of Question. learning from their mistake and grant Ombudsman oversight of is the health care system? Sir, health and long -term care. So, uh, Speaker, I, I think the, I know the member opposite is um, is deeply interested in making sure that health care in this province is delivered to patients who need it. Yeah. I know that she would be interested in knowing what is happening at Orange, Speaker. There is a new patient advocate in place now. They've got a conflict of interest protocol established. Of course, they have a new CEO, a new COO, and a new board, Speaker. Their salaries of senior leadership has been posted online. The whistleblower hotline is now active. Uh, the new medical interiors have been approved. The Thunder Bay Brace and Member from Kitchener Waterloo plan has been approved, Speaker. Uh, there's a lot of good things happening at Orange, and I know that the member opposite would also be very happy to know that the two surplus helicopters yes, have been sold. Thank you. No question. The member from Scarborough Legion Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, in the recent Ontario budget, I was thrilled to see the commitment made to continue to support the Northern de Regional Development. Mr. Speaker, I was speaking specifically about the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation, which provides funding for entrepreneurs who are committed to creating jobs and growing business in Northern Ontario communities. When I was in Timmins and Thunder Bay for pre-budget consultation, I saw firsthand the positive impact this program is having in Northern communities. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you please inform the House how our government's commitment in 2013 budget to the NO HFC will provide positive impact on communities all across Northern Ontario. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the member for Scarborough Asia Group for the question. And certainly, uh, the Northern Ontario uh, Heritage Fund Corporation is something that, as a government, we're very, very proud of, and as Northerners, we're particularly proud of. And may I say, it's a thrill uh, as minister to be in a position to chair that, the Heritage Fund Board. What we are excited about is our strong commitment in the 2013 budget, $100 million in annual funding to the uh, to the program, of course, which is an increase from $60 million from the last term. And uh, this is something that makes a great deal difference in terms of job creation in the north. Uh, some interesting statistics, Speaker. Since 2003, the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation has approved over $834 million in funding, leveraging over $3 billion, and towards 5,000-plus projects. Over 22,000 jobs have been created in the north and retained in the north. Great news for economic development in Northern Ontario. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. After listening to the minister, it is quite clear that Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation is having a positive impact across the entire north. Mr. Speaker, where I believe the NOHFC is having a big impact is to giving Northern Ontario young entrepreneurs the best possible start. While I was in North Thunder Bay, I had a conversation with young Ontarians who were able to remain in the hometowns in Northern Ontario because they were given an opportunity through the NOHFC funding and a start business that provided them with the best possible start of the young entrepreneur career. Although these entrepreneurs may have ventured down different business uh, paths, what they have in common is that they are able to create jobs in Northern Ontario. Once again, through you, Minister, to, uh, Speaker, to the Minister, can he please share with the House how young entrepreneurs from across Northern Ontario are being positively impacted by our government commitment to Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation? Minister Northern I'm, Mines and I'm, I'm just, of course, delighted with the support from the member of Scarborough Asian Court and all my colleagues on all sides of the House. Uh, I mean, certainly speaking of the positive work the Heritage Fund is doing to support young 
entrepreneurs in Northern Ontario. We want to keep our young people in the north, and we are supporting our uh, young business people with creative uh, and strong business ideas in creating their own job opportunities by opening up their own businesses. And this does allow them to stay in their community. It allows them to contribute to the local economy and create jobs. And you know, I could go through a long, long list. We have uh, uh, we've helped young entrepreneurs. We funded a, a fitness center in Sudbury, a, a music studio in Kenora, cl a clothing company, a wonderful one that I've patronized myself in Thunder Bay. Well, just sure. just Bay. naming a few. The practice we've approved over 400 projects, speaker, and created over 800 jobs. Wow. It's truly tremendous to see the government working to keep young people in the north and helping them pursue their dreams and their visions. Thank, Thank you, Mr. you. Speaker. The question, the member from Holland and Norfolk. Speaker to the uh, Minister of Community and Social Services. We have a made in Ontario crisis from years of neglecting our developmentally disabled. We've all heard the disturbing stories of families unable to cope. The Callahans are coming to Queen's Park today. 20 year old Anna is developmentally disabled and requires care 24 7. Both parents work. Anna is eligible for 24 hours of nursing care a week. The Cowhands asked for only 34 hours a month, but in March, her agency could only provide 12. When Anna finishes her education next month, she will have no supports. This afternoon, our health critic is calling for a select committee on developmental disabilities to ensure that Anna, the Callahans, other families uh, receive the support they require. Minister, do we have your support for this uh, resolution? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to, uh, 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 to say uh, in support of the uh, colleague opposite that I'll be delighted to support the motion this afternoon. Excellent. I think anything we can do together uh, to address uh, some of the serious challenges that we have is something that we must do. And, and I would just point out that, uh, that one of the ways uh, we're trying to address some serious challenges uh, uh, that we must all address is through our budget. And uh, I specifically point to the uh, additional influx of dollars uh, uh, to assist in the developmental uh, disability sector. I'm sure the members opposite support that. And I'll be delighted uh, to support the motion and urge all my colleagues on this side to do the same thing. We can use Answer. all the help together that we can get. And if we can do it uh, on behalf of the people who are most vulnerable, good for us. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, I'm very to hear that, Minister. Thank you. And while we are grateful, and the sector is grateful for the money that has been um, allocated in this year's budget, we know that it will be not be sufficient to help all of the 12,000 people who are on the wait list for service. It will help somewhat, but there are some innovative solutions that are being proposed by service providers across the province, and I believe that the select committee shall have the opportunity to explore those and be able to disseminate them across the province. So I am very grateful for your support. We look forward to the committee being established in order and just so it can begin its work as soon as possible because as the minister knows the need is urgent thank you minister well mr speaker i'm pleased to hear that uh, anything that we could do together to respond uh, more appropriately to the most vulnerable folk that uh, are there and need our help is good um, you're right there's a lot of innovative ideas that uh, we can't do you, I hope that do you want to hear the answer? Yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, I do. Uh, maybe your colleague uh, in front who asked a serious question will have a, we'll have a chat with you, but uh, we're, we're with you, and I think together we can get some important and uh, some good innovative things done that will serve a lot more people, and I think we'll all in the end be able to feel good, good uh, about having worked together to do that. Thank you. Question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. Speaker, my uh, question is to the Deputy Premier. Premier, there is laws in this land that says that you have to hang on to documents. You cannot shred documents as a result of leaving your employee when you work in the Premier's office, you work within the government. There's something that's called a preservation notice. And Chris Morley, your chief of staff, along with all of the staff in the Premier's office, would have got these preservation notices in order to not shred documents. So the question to the Deputy Premier is this. Why did Chris Morley, the Premier's chief of staff, shred documents as he left the employer of the Premier last June? Deputy Premier. 
So, um, uh, Government House Leader. Thank Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. In terms of uh, some of the uh, specific cases that uh, the honourable member raises, uh, as members know, there is a, a committee of this legislature which is looking into actually the issue of uh, documents. That was the the beginning or the the main focus of the uh, committee before it was broadened. But in terms of the general question, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you both as uh, House Leader and as Minister of Government Services that we take uh, our obligations very seriously as a government. We are very committed to being open and transparent. There are record uh, retention rules, as the honourable member awares, is aware, that require that certain official government records are retained as long as needed. We have taken a number of steps uh, in terms of new staff, particularly new political staff here, to make sure that they are aware of that obligation, and we certainly take it Answer. seriously and will continue to work with the system to make sure that the rules are followed. You, supplementary. The rules were not followed. That's the point. People left the employee of the government as political staff and they destroyed the documents. They hit the delete buttons and cleared the archives so that the records would not exist to shed light on the decisions that were made by your government. So how can you stand in this House and say that you're living up to the law when it's clear in committee testimony says they deleted the records? So I say to you again, are you above the law and how do you get the rights to shred records? Order. 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 Mr. Speaker, we have made every effort to provide the committee with the information that they've requested. As members are aware, there was an initial uh, 56,000 documents that have come forward. The committee has asked for other documents that we have worked diligently to provide to the committee. Mr. Speaker, the Premier not only asked the Auditor General to come in, not only offered a select committee, which the opposition, they including that down, member's party, picture. turned it down, but she offered a broad government-wide search, broader than anything that had been asked for by the committee. Mr. Speaker, we made that offer through Liberal members of the committee, and the opposition turned it down. Oh, As I said, Mr. Speaker, we take our obligation shame. very seriously, Answer. and we are working particularly with new staff to make sure that the safeguards are in place for going forward. Thank you. The question the member from Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Honourable Minister responsible for seniors. Speaker, recently we witnessed some terrible instances of domestic senior abuse. Speaker, many seniors may find themselves weak and defenseless, defenseless, while others may suffer from conditions such as dementia, leaving them in a state of vulnerability. Speaker, for many seniors in my riding at Glengarry Prescott Russell, this is a serious concern, but more so, it is a concern for family members who worry and wonder how their loved ones can feel safe and secure in their residence. So, Speaker, I'm asking the minister today, what measures is our government taking to ensure that our seniors living in retirement homes will not be subjected to abuse. Thank you. Minister responsible for seniors. Thank you very much, and thanks to the uh, member from Glencairn, Prescott Russell, Speaker. Our government does not tolerate any form of elder abuse, Speaker. It is my commitment and that of this government to make sure that our seniors live in a healthy and safe home. Speaker, we were the first government in Canada to introduce a strategy to combat elder abuse, setting very clear terms uh, for our seniors. In 2003, Ontario invested some $8 million in elder abuse prevention and awareness initiatives. Speaker. Additionally, in 2010, our government passed the Retirement uh, Home Act, the first provincial legislation protecting seniors in retirement homes. Speaker, requiring to have a policy in place as well, promoting zero Answer. tolerance of elder abuse, complies with the res uh, with complying with the Residents' Bill of Rights, ensuring mandatory annual staff training on fire prevention and safety, Thank zero you. tolerance of elder abuse, and whistleblowing as well. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, uh, and thank you, Minister, for advising us on the measures already taken to prevent abuse and neglect of seniors. But, Speaker, abuses take many different forms and are often perpetrated by close member, family members or acquaintances, and sadly, these are not reported. Minister, it's a serious problem as too many remain silent due to fear, shame or lack of awareness. And as you know, Minister, the senior population is growing, 
more than doubling by 2036. And with that demographic in mind, the number of seniors seeking alternative living in retirement homes is going to rise dramatically as well. Through you, Speaker, to the Minister, in order to prevent and eliminate elder abuse, could he, the Minister, please tell us what actions are being taken by the Ministry? Thank you, Minister. Uh, Speaker, I can appreciate the uh, member's uh, commitment to the uh, well being of seniors. And let me say, Speaker, that as the Minister responsible, responsible for seniors, the Premier and his government treat the well being, safety, and privacy of seniors in this province with utmost importance. Speaker, our proposed budget further addresses the elder abuse by continuing to commit Ontario's action plan for seniors to provide better access to health care, quality resources, and improved safety and security for Ontario uh, seniors. The budget also demonstrates the government's committed to moving forward with additional recommendations concerning senior safety, uh, as well from uh, uh, Dr. Samersina's report, Living Longer, Living Well. Speaker, together with the public education, raising awareness, we can provide seniors with a safe and enjoyable retirement home. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Here, here, here. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Minister, I would like to inform you about a long-standing problem with our outdated labour laws in this province. For years, certain unions have successfully exploited a legal loophole in the Labour Relations Act that allows them to certify municipalities and school boards as, they were, as if they were construction companies. Once this happens, the public sector employers become trapped in a labour monopoly, which requires them by law to contract out all publicly funded infrastructure projects to companies organized by a specific union. This unfair practice, on average, restricts 70 per cent of qualified contractors from working on public projects and increases infrastructure costs by 40 per cent. Minister, will you take a stand for taxpayers today in, by closing this loophole? I doubt it. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I appreciate the member for raising an important issue. I believe the member opposite is also be tabling a private member's bill on this uh, on this matter either today or sometime soon. And I look forward to reading the bill and the content of the bill. But, Speaker, uh, as you know, our government uh, believes in a fair balance between uh, uh, in between labor relations. Uh, we want to make sure that all parties involved in labor negotiations have have uh, the opportunity to to negotiate agreements uh, that are fair to both parties. Now, I do understand that some broader public service institutions uh, have become bound to province-wide uh, construction uh, agreement speakers. There is a provision within the Ontario Labor Relations Act that allows for those uh, broader public service employers to seek exemption. They have to file uh, to the Ontario Labor Relations Board in order to do so, and then there's a process that, that uh, ensues from there on, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, that uh, process is actually flawed, and this is not a project that can be reviewed, studied, analyzed, evaluated, and assessed just so we can have another conversation about it. It requires action now. Certain unions have already trapped several public sector employers in labour monopolies, including Hamilton, Toronto, Sault Ste. Marie, and the Essex School Board. And now the region of Waterloo is at risk of becoming the next victim of this legal loophole at a cost of roughly $78 million. Oh. Minister, today, in fact, I'll be tabling the Fair and Open Tendering Act to protect taxpayers in my region and in all communities across this province. Will you take a stand for Ontario taxpayers and end closed tendering today? Speaker, I, I, I noticed with interest that the member opposite called the system flawed. I don't know if he remembers that it was in 1998 that Jim Flaherty, then Minister of Labour, actually put that system in place, oh, no. and then further on in 2000 refined that system even wow. further. The system we have in place was actually put in the Order. watch of the previous oh. Conservative government, which is now the official opposition. So the, the system has been the system has been there and has worked, uh, Speaker, well uh, over the years. It's a system that is designed. Uh, so that an arm's length agency, uh, uh, tribunal like the Ontario Labor Relations Board, is the one making the decision whether an employer is a we'll construction a or a non-construction employer. The government should not be making those decisions, speakers. The, Order. the board should be making those decisions. However, I, the, the member opposite is tabling a bill. I look forward to reading the bill uh, and having further discussions with him on that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Here, here. No question. The member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. 
Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Minister of Labour. Speaker, many children work in Ontario's recorded and live entertainment industries, and many of these children work in substandard conditions. Some very young toddlers are being denied basic rest periods, healthy snacks, and safe waiting areas, and many older children work excessive hours each day. Speaker, can the minister tell us what successive Liberal governments have done to provide real protection for child performers? Minister of Labour. Well, uh, Speaker, we have obviously, uh, under our employment standards uh, laws, we have uh, strict uh, rules around uh, the kind of duties that children can, uh, can participate in. Um, and I look forward to learning, obviously, more about this issue with the member opposite. If he has any specific concerns, uh, I ask him to uh, provide me that information, and then we can work together on it. Most recently, Speaker, I had the opportunity to meet with the Actors Union as well, ACTRA. Uh, they did not raise this issue uh, to me, but I will, along with you, reach out to them to see if there's any specific issues that we can together work to ensure that all children uh, uh, in our province are protected and uh, nobody is abused or violated. Here, Thank here. you, Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, yesterday I tabled Bill 71, the Protecting Child Performers Act 2013. Writing this bill was a collaboration among ACTRA, Equity, my staff, and the Legislative Council, Legal Council. It's a good bill, Speaker. And then, coupled with strong regulations, that will provide significant protection for child performers in Ontario. It will be a model for other provinces to follow. Speaker, why has this government never supported legislation that would bring in long overdue protection for child performers? Minister of Labour. Uh, Speaker, uh, Speaker, first of all, the member opposite is tabling a bill, and I look forward to uh, reading the bill and, and, and making sure, giving it careful consideration. So thank you very much for your work on this. Thank you for working with important partner stakeholders on this, because it's important. But, uh, Speaker, I do want to say that we respect the member's concern for health and safety and employment standards the children enjoy in the workplace. And in fact, Speaker, to address those concerns uh, regarding the implementation of health and safety laws for children in this industry, we have an excellent and readily accessible child performance guideline for reference. If that reference, that guideline is not sufficient and your bill has some more to offer, let's work together and see how we can improve on it. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa Orleans. Mr. Speaker, my question through you is to the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. We have made great strides in our education system. Our graduation rates and test scores continue to rise, and our education system is considered one of the best in the English-speaking world, if not the world. But to have a great education system is so important that we, that we do more to ensure that all of our students, no matter where they live, have access to a world-class education. I know that there is a lot more work that needs to be done to address the student achievement gap between Aboriginal students and non-Aboriginal students. At my budget breakfast last Friday, there was concern by several people about this important issue. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, could the Minister please inform this House on what is being done to improve educational outcomes for Ab Aboriginal youth? Thank you. Thank Minister you. of Aboriginal Affairs. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Speaker. Speaker, cl uh, closing the achievement gap between Aboriginal students and non-Aboriginal students, whether it's on reserve or off re reserve, is a priority of this Premier. It's a priority of me as Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, and I know it's a priority for the Minister of Education. And I'll ask the Minister of Education and the supplemental to give some of the, the details. But closing that gap is important because education is the key. Education is the key to raising oneself up in the socio-economic status. In that regard, last uh, Monday or Tuesday night, I, along with uh, Jeff Leal, the Minister of Rural Affairs, participated in a conference at Trent University, one of the leading universities for Aboriginal studies in Canada. Tom Simons, Harvey McHugh, Paul Martin, and Answer. Aboriginal leaders, experts in Aboriginal education, we had a conversation to begin addressing this issue. Similarly, I attended a conference in Winnipeg, all Aboriginal Affairs Ministers Thank you. of Ontario, but no federal participation. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We can all agree we want a fair and equal Ontario. 
I'm pleased to see that the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs has taken such strong interest in improving student achievement for Aboriginal students. I know that our budget commits further funding to support our Aboriginal students. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, what are some other initiatives our government has undertaken to assist Aboriginal students? Mr. Minister of Education. Mr. of Education. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ottawa, Orleans, for his uh, excellent question. I've been ple uh, pleased to work very closely with the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs as we work towards improving outcomes for Aboriginal students. For example, last month, the Nishnabiaski Nation, the federal government, and our government signed an historic memorandum of understanding. The agreement calls for all three parties to work together to support NAN youth so that they have every opportunity at success. Mr. Speaker, our government is providing over $45 million to improve student achievement for First Nations students. And our budget, which we should get passed, commits an additional $5 million per year to support our Aboriginal students. Speaker, we know that more work needs to be done to support Aboriginal student achievement in Ontario. And our government is committed to ensuring that all students yes, in sir. Ontario have access to our world-class uh, education system. But I Thank you. Thank you. Your question? The member from Huron, Bruce. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Best speech. My question today is for the Minister of Energy. Minister, can you tell me how much first-hand experience the ministers of Environment, Municipal Affairs and Housing, and Rural Affairs have with dealing and in dealing with industrial wind turbines? Energy. I thank the member for Euron Bruce for the question, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about renewable energy uh, projects in the province of Ontario, a significant part of our long-term uh, energy plan. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the FIT program uh, has generated 31,000 jobs. It's had a very large take-up in rural communities, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in fact, over the last two or three weeks, I've met with uh, a number of co-ops uh, with very significant representation from farmers in the rural community. They are asking for more uh, renewable projects. They're looking for more procurement so they can be part of eliminating dirty coal generation in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue working with renewable energy proponents, including those in the rural areas. We have had some difficulties, yes, Mr. Sir. Speaker, particularly in the rural areas. We're addressing those uh, by uh, putting together a program that will give municipalities more control, Thank particularly you. over wind. Supplementary. Minister, I can tell you that the people on this side of the House have lots of experience in dealing with wind turbines, and you would be wise to listen to us because, I'm sorry to say, this window is broken too. Your working group of four is a little too late in devising a proper plan for the siting of wind turbines. Nevertheless, I hope your plans include going to places like Huron County and Bruce County and talk to people who are facing 1,000 more turbines around the homes. More. And don't forget about the people of Simcoe Simpo Simpo Gray, Durham, Amherst Island, Wellington Halton Hills, Haldem and Norfolk, Dufferin Caledon, Lambton Kent Middlesex, Northumberland Quinty West, Chatham Kent Essex, Perth Wellington, Nipissing, Prince Edward Hastings, and Halliburton Quartha Lakes Brock while you're at it. Minister, your Premier Question. talks about wanting to work together in this parliament. In the spirit of working together and cooperating, Will you invite members of the opposition to join your working group to provide first hand insight and want to talk about industrial materials? Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to refer this to the Minister of Rural Affairs. <laughs> Minister of Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our government believes that strong, healthy Ontario includes strong, healthy rural communities. Our government is committed to working with municipalities on the setting of wind turbines. To That's enough. Answer, please. No, don't start right as soon as I stop. Speaking with rural municipalities and stakeholders, and we'll continue to advocate for them as we move forward on this very important issue. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
member from Beaches East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. It is now being reported that the OLG has a funding formula for a Toronto casino. OLG is, is telling people they have provided that formula to the Premier's office. Will the government come clean and tell Ontarians if OLG has provided the funding formula to this government? Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, we have uh, transformational changes happening at the OLG. We've made a commitment that we will also revise the funding formula to be equitable and equal throughout the province. We're taking the steps necessary to reflect those issues and to ensure that everyone is treated equally. But I think what the matter that the, uh, the member is asking is the decision that has to be now made by those municipalities, and in this case, Toronto. Toronto has before them a, a decision to make with regards to proponents who are looking to invest over $3 billion in capital infusion. And regardless of the hosting fee, they have to make a determination if they are interested in having a casino and, for that matter, Answer. all the other aspects that they're proposing to bring forward. I will say this. We will release the, uh, the formula when we are comfortable that it does, in fact, allow for equity Thank and you. fairness throughout the entire province. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's absolutely clear now that the government has the formula and that they refuse and have refused to release it. The government needs to be transparent about its plans for a Toronto casino. They need to be transparent with this legislature. They need to be transparent with the City Council. And most importantly, they need to be transparent with all Ontarians. OLG says it has provided the government with the funding formula for the Toronto Casino. Will the Finance Minister come clean with Ontarians and stop hiding the new casino funding formula? Finance. Mr. Speaker. The formula already exists. What we're looking for is alternatives to actually enhance the valuations of these hosting fees right across the province. It's not going to be unique to Toronto. It's going to be for the entire province. And we have alternatives that we're reviewing. When we are comfortable with those reviews, when we are comfortable with how best to address the needs of the entire province, not just one municipality, we will release it. We're not hiding anything. It's already there to be seen. What is necessary, though, is that the municipalities and those that have the funding for it as before us now make a determination if, in fact, they want to even entertain the notion of having a casino Sir, in, their, uh, in their respective municipality. Thank you. New question. The member from Oakville. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I've got a question this morning for the Minister of Research and Innovation. Uh, Speaker, I know our province has made significant employment gains since the end of the recession. Our government's invested in programs and initiatives that increase employment and grow our economy. But while important gains have been made, our youth employment rate simply needs to be better. When I speak to young people in my riding of Oakville and around Ontario, they say the government needs to continue taking action and needs to continue to invest in programs that increase employment opportunities for young people. Speaker, Ontario's young people are highly educated, they're very talented, they're very capable. It's important that we provide them with the opportunities that they need to succeed. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is this government doing to improve employment opportunities for young people in the province? Mr. Research and Innovation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Oakville for that question. Mr. Speaker, creating opportunities for Ontario's youth is a priority for our government. I am proud to say that our budget reaffirms this commitment. With an investment of $295 million, our government's comprehensive new jobs strategy will help promote employment opportunities, entrepreneurship and innovation for youth in this province of Ontario. As the Minister of Research and Innovation, Mr. Speaker, I have first-hand opportunity to see the, the effect of entrepreneurship and innovation in the production of results. Through entrepreneurship and innovation, 
jobs are created, economic growth is possible, and also solutions to our challenges can be found. Answer. Mr. Speaker, our government's youth job strategy recognizes the importance of supporting entrepreneurship and innovation in this province. They are the driving force for our future and the foundation for our knowledge-based economy. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'm glad to hear we are continuing to make those investments and programs that support our youth. Our budget commitment of $295 million to the uh, Ontario Youth Job Strategy, I think, is an important step in improving youth employment. It's an investment that I'm proud to tell my constituents about in Oakville. By investing in initiatives that support youth employment opportunities, entrepreneurship and innovation, our province will be able to compete and succeed in today's global knowledge-based economy. With increasing competition and an aging population, it's more important than ever that we provide our youth with the training, the tools, and the skills that they need to succeed. Ontario's success, obviously, is directly linked to the success of our youth. Question. Through you, Speaker, can the Minister of Innovation please tell us more about the youth job strategy in the province? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I thank the member from Oakville for that question. Mr. Speaker, our youth job strategy will bring together youth, young professionals and community leaders to help develop training and employment opportunities. Through the youth job strategy, our government is committed $45 million to the youth Ontario Youth Entrepreneurship Fund. This fund will help generate nearly 6,000 mentorship and job opportunities. Our government will also invest $30 million Mr. Speaker, in the Ontario Youth Innovation Fund. This fund will support our youth to develop the skills they need to conduct research and commercialize their innovation. It will also support young entrepreneurs at universities and colleges. Mr. Speaker, by investing in initiatives that support employment, entrepreneurship and innovation, our youth will have the opportunity to succeed and ensure that our province of Ontario will remain as a leader in the global market. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Huron-Bruce has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Energy concerning the Working Group on Sitting Industrial Wind Turbines. This matter will... All day. This matter will be debated Thursday, May 28th uh, at 6 p.m. I have some sad news. This is the last day for our pages. And we want to thank them for the wonderful work that they have done and wish them well back at school. of the environment has indicated he's going to double their pay. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.